Hey, good morning. Welcome to Oasis Church Online. My name is Adam, and I'm so glad that you are joining us today. Well, Christmas is coming faster than you know it. And one thing that we're going to do this year is celebrate Advent, the anticipation of Jesus' arrival as a church with daily devotional readings. Uh, I'll mention it more in the service, but I wanted to let you know, even though you can't scan the QR code, you can find everything you need to sign up at oasischurch.ca slash Advent Journey. It's going to be a good service and we get to do it together. So I'll see you on the other side. I can't wait. Good morning. Welcome here to Oasis Church. My name is Adam. I'm a part of the staff team. And whether you are here in the building or you are tuning in online, I am so glad that you are here today. Thank you for coming to church. If you're wondering what to expect, you'll be here for about an hour. And today we get to hear from one of our pastors, Daryl Jansen, who's going to be up about halfway through the service to speak with us. Maybe you are wondering how you can become more involved in the life of this church, maybe a little bit more connected. I've got something for you. We call these our next steps. There are life groups and our serving teams. Uh, and maybe you've passed some people on your way in at a place we call guest services. Uh, they would love to talk to you more about uh, how to get involved and maybe share some of their stories as well. Maybe you can benefit from somebody else's experience. I'm sure you can kind of start to feel it in the air, but everybody's getting ready for Christmas, us included. And we hope that you'll join us at one of our Christmas Eve services. You can see the service times there, the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th of December. But today, I actually want to tell you another way we celebrate Christmas here. We call it our month of generosity. And this is one way that we support and partner with local organizations in our community doing great work through practical donations. And next Sunday, Sunday, you have the opportunity to help us support the Westdale Food Bank. I'm sure you, as well as many others, have experienced the rising food costs, and uh, the food banks have been experiencing this as well. Food bank usage has been increasing steadily year over year, and so they need our help more than ever. What you can do, if you'd like to help out, is visit our website. Uh, there you'll find a list of the most needed items for the Westdale Food Bank. If you bring some of those to church with you on Sunday, next Sunday, leave them behind your car and somebody's going to drive the parking lot, pick everything up, and bring it to the food bank. We're going to support four organizations over three Sundays, so if you want more information, you can find it all on our website. Now we have an opportunity to sing together. And the first song we're going to sing, one of my favorites, 10,000 Reasons or Bless the Lord. And it repeats this phrase over and over again, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. But it's not 
that we're giving God something that he doesn't have, the way that we usually understand blessing, what we are doing is telling God what he already is, what we know to be true, that he is good and kind and just, that he is holy and worthy of our praise. So let's get to it. If you're able, let's stand and we'll all sing together. Here we go. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, I worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Oh 
in our ears so that we can hear the beat and we're all playing in unison and I, I had this one out today. I don't usually do that and you guys sounded great. Thank you for singing, which makes me excited for our next song. It's called Made For More and uh, if you know it, great. Sing all the louder and uh, if you don't, do something with me and just take a look at the lyrics. And I think like sometimes we sing songs and they just get like really generic. Like this one has been playing in my head for weeks 
but it's like one of those songs that get like obsessive and like the chorus just goes around and around and you can't stop thinking about it and then you get sick of it and I'm like almost there with that song right now <laughs> but it's still a lot of fun when you play it with the band it's really good uh, but moving on <laughs> moving on the the chorus um, lyrics are just really good it just talks about like I wasn't made to be tending a grave and tending a grave, like we tend gardens, right? To make things grow. We don't tend graves because nothing grows. Um, and uh, there's lots of just like really fun um, lyrics in this song. But like, I think for me, I really had to wrestle with this song before I felt like we could sing it or I could sing it with you this morning. And the reason why is because it opens up with this. And Ashra sings it amazing. You'll hear it in just a second. But it goes, I know who I am and I know who you are. And like, I've historically had like problems with like singing that. And the, and the reason why is because like, I know the answers. I know who God is. And I know who I'm supposed to be. But when I look at the vast distance between the man that I feel that I am and the man I feel I ought to be, I feel like honestly sometimes I'm tending a grave. And I'm like, what is, what's going on here? What's the disconnect? I'm made for more, but sometimes, and I know that, I know I'm made for more, but sometimes I just feel crushed by the weight of expectation. And so singing songs like this could be really hard for me because I don't always agree with it. And it really depends on how I feel. And I've had to learn to fight how I feel with truth. And the truth is this, is I know who I am. And I know who God is. He's the creator of the universe who has chosen and called me to be his child. We are made in his image. I am made in his image. We're sons and daughters of the living God who knew, and this is the part that just blows my mind, is that he knew my mistakes before he made me. He knows everything I've ever done and ever will do before he called my name. Before I even had the chance to say yes. And that just wrecks me. That someone could just love me and I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to prove myself. And so when I sing made for more, it's not because I'm trying to, to work myself, to be a good Christian, to achieve some unattainable goal. But in scripture, the truth that I fight those thoughts with is my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. And Paul says, so I will boast all the more because the spirit of the risen Lord now rests on me. And rather than being complacent with my feelings of failure, I'm gonna fight it with truth. And that's why I just love this song. That's why it just keeps coming back in my head. Because there's times when I don't feel like enough, but grace is waiting for me. And that grace is enough for me to continue walking closely with my God. So if you could stand up, we're gonna sing this song together. I'm really excited.
Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for that fountain of grace that over and over gives us not the thing that we deserve, but the thing that Jesus deserves. We thank you that in knowing us before we were born, Father, you decided that you would prepare every one of our days for us, that you would give us a hope and a future, and that you would determine that we can be adopted into your family through the blood of Jesus as full and complete inheritors. You are so great. We thank you for your loving kindness that you have given us without restraint. In Jesus' name we said, amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. As I mentioned, Christmas will soon be upon us, and one of the things that the church does year over year across the globe is we take a month to celebrate Advent. It's a season for us where we anticipate and meditate on what it meant for Jesus to come to earth to take our form uh, in preparation of Christmas. And this year, we're going to be trying something new. We're very excited about it. Uh, we're going to provide daily Advent devotionals, every single one of them written by a member of the Oasis staff team, uh, so that we can all together meditate on what it meant for Christ to come and join us here on earth. Uh, now we're going to text these out to you or email them every morning. Uh, and all you need to do to sign up is uh, scan the QR code on the back of the seat in front of you or visit our website. Uh, let us know how you'd like to receive them and where we can send them to. And all through December, right up until Christmas, we will all get to meditate on Scripture as we anticipate celebrating Jesus' arrival. I hope you'll join us. Now we're going to transition into a time of giving. Now if you're our guest here today, please don't feel obligated to participate in this part of the service. Um, but for the Oasis family, I'd love to encourage your giving with the words of Jesus. This is what he says in Matthew 6, 20 and 21 to help us reshape our perspective around finances. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you choose to give, I, I hope you give with that perspective today. We'll give those of you who choose to do that a few minutes moments to do that now. Thanks again for your giving.
We make a lot of decisions every day, don't we? And sometimes we make decisions very purposefully. Other times uh, we make decisions without giving much thought to them, right? And probably all of us have gotten ourselves into trouble when we find ourselves making decisions uh, without thinking. We're making these decisions with the wrong motive, with the wrong why behind it, right? And uh, one of the reasons why uh, we can find ourselves in a predicament like that is because in Canada, here we live in what you could call a performance culture, right? And, and what I mean by that is you get what you deserve, right? Or you could say what you put in is what you get out, right? It's a performance-based culture. You get what you deserve. And I don't know if you remember this uh, commercial. It's pro- I think it's probably 20 years old. Some of you weren't even born when this came out. Um, but I, I, do- I think it was for Nike or Gatorade. I don't exactly remember, but what I remember is this choir of kids singing, I know I can be what I want to be. If I work hard at it, I'll be where I want to be. I don't really know why I remember that so vividly. I guess the kids are really cute, but that, that commercial, just really speaks to the culture that we live in, doesn't it? I can be whatever I want to be if I work hard enough, right? If I work hard at it, I'm going to get what I deserve. I'll get out of uh, of it whatever I put in. I can work hard enough to achieve it, right? And, And we get that. We understand how that works in a lot of different areas of our lives, right? Let's say uh, if you're in school right now, your college or university, you get how this works, right? That if you actually get up in the morning, okay, and go to class, you'll probably um, understand the subject a little bit better, right? And if you understand the subject a little bit better, you'll probably do better on on the the tests and the exams and on your projects, right? And if that happens and you perform, uh, then you'll probably, uh, increase your, your, your marks in that class and that will increase your entire GPA, right? And if that happens, obviously the hope is then that you will be able to continue living at home without having to pay rent, right? That, (laughs) That's where, okay, maybe your top rung is a little different than that, but we get how that works, right? You perform, you get rewarded, you keep performing, you keep getting more rewards, right? And that's not just school, right? That's also uh, at your job, right? If you're in the workforce, you get this, you've seen this. If you put in good work, the hope is you will get a pay raise, right? And then you keep performing well, you'll get a promotion. You keep performing well, maybe they'll put you in charge of a a team of people, and maybe eventually a whole department of people. And you keep performing well, maybe you'll be put in charge of the entire company, right? And become the boss. And maybe there's more or different rungs in there, but that's how that works, right? You perform and you keep getting rewards. And, and, and this happens in so many different areas, right? We could use lots of different examples of how this plays out in our lives, right? For husbands in the room, you get this, right? Your wife's gone for the day. You pull out the honey-do list and you start knocking things off, you know, done, 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 done. The hope is when she gets home, your performance is going to get rewarded with a quiet night on the couch watching sports, Right? <laughs> We get how this works. We, we perform and we expect there to be a reward for our performance. You get what you deserve. That's how it works. And I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, right? If you have hopes and, and dreams and, and goals, this can drive you to work hard and to perform so that you can accomplish those goals. And it's good to accomplish goals. But the problem comes when this, um, this becomes a, a performance addiction and it becomes the way that we see our whole lives and everything in the world and it starts to affect even our relationships. And the biggest problem comes when this has an impact on our faith and we start to think that, that our performance will have an impact on our relationship with God. And, and we, in fact, believe that our good performance leads to right standing with God. That as long as I perform well enough, God is going to love me. Things will be okay between, you know, me and God, right? We think the better person I am, the more God is gonna love me, right? And, and we start believing things like, you know, if, if I, you know, stop cussing, you know, that's gonna make God happy, right? And, you know, if I can make it to church like every week for a month straight, like, like every single week, perfect attendance, gold star, It's going to make God pretty happy, right? And if I even muster up the courage to join a serving team and I I go and volunteer even when I don't really feel like it, God is going to love me so much, right? And we think we perform for God and that causes him to love us. The better we perform, the more he loves us. The, The better our standing will be with God. But there's 
some big problems with that, right? And some of you have experienced that. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You've experienced problems when, w- without realizing, maybe not intentionally, you have lived with this kind of idea in mind, thinking that the good things you're doing for God are, are improving your, your standing with God. And, and maybe you've experienced some of these three things that can happen when we live this way. The first one is you become exhausted, Right? You're trying so hard to, to live up to this, this standard. Right? You're trying so hard to, to get to the top, but it feels like you're kind of down here and you're struggling. Right? And you're like, oh, I'm trying to be perfect. I'm trying to be perfect. I'm trying to be perfect. Oh, I messed up. Now I'm back down here. Okay, I'm trying to be perfect. I'm trying to be perfect. I'm trying to be oh, I messed up. God, I don't even know if God loves me anymore. Like, right? And it becomes exhausting trying to perform for God when you think that, that your performance is tied to God's love for you, his, you know, how he sees you, it can become exhausting. And probably a lot of us in the room have found ourselves at some point wondering, is it even worth it? Maybe if you're honest with yourself, you'd say you've found yourself being judgmental. If I'm honest, I've been there. For sure I've been there. You know, we're not intentionally, but I'm, I'm trying so hard to like live for Jesus and, and be a good person and be like Jesus that, you know, that eventually these thoughts creep in like, Daryl, you, you are doing pretty well. You're, you're, you're killing it. You're becoming, you've made a lot of progress and you may not be quite at the top yet, but if you look around you, you're doing better than some of those other people there, right? Maybe you've been there before. Where, where you start believing things, you know, about other people, and you start looking around at the people that, that, that you see, and you start thinking, man, I can't believe you still talk like that. I can't, I can't believe you still dress like that. I can't believe you still go to those places. I can't believe you still act that way. Oh my gosh, right? And people don't even want to be around you because they walk into the room and they sense your judgment because of the way that you see them, right? And, and, and when we look at life and look at faith in God through a performance filter, it's pretty easy to start looking around and comparing to other people and becoming judgmental toward others. Maybe you'd say that you've felt excluded because of this, right? You feel like you're on the outside. You feel like, man, there's, there's no way I could even measure up. Like I've seen some people that they've been at this thing for years and years and years, and I'm new to this. I, I've made a lot of mistakes. I, I've messed up. Like I don't even know if I could ever do this Jesus thing that y'all are talking about, right? And maybe you're watching online because you can't even imagine what it would be like to be in a room. You don't want to imagine being in a room full of church people. Or maybe you did muster up the courage to come today, but you came terrified to even walk into the doors of this building because you, you, you assumed that your you know, poor performance would be plastered on your forehead and everyone would see and everyone would know and people would be judging you for it because you're not as good as them, right? And maybe you thought like, yeah, this three rung ladder is cool, but like I know some people, they're on like the 90th rung. I'm way down here. Like I don't think I'll ever get there. And it feels like, you know, that I'm supposed to be like Jesus. Well, he's on the millionth rung. Like, like th- there's so much pressure here to perform, to be a better person than I am. And perhaps you've wondered, like, why even try? Why even bother? But can I, I tell you that this is not God's plan? Okay, this is not God's plan for you. This performance filter, exhausted, judgmental, excluded. This is not God's design. This is not God's desire for you and for me. But I've got some good news, okay? The performance filter isn't our only option. There's a better option out there. And this one is, is something that makes Christianity far more appealing, far more attractive, and far more accessible, and it's a complete game changer. And someone who knew very well this, this perspective shift that I'm talking about right now was the Apostle Paul. Paul wrote uh, 13 letters to, um, to the churches a couple thousand years ago when this whole Jesus thing was just getting off the ground. He wrote 13 letters that, that became part of our New Testament. And um, he wrote uh, these letters mostly to churches that he himself started around the Mediterranean Rim. And so uh, Paul was a big deal and is a big deal in the Christian faith. But Paul also had a past. You see, Paul lived uh, uh, some of his life living through this performance filter. And, and it was that, that that drove his decisions that, that he made. And so in the letter that he wrote to um, the church in Philippi, he kind of looks back on it. He reflects on 
the old him, the, the way that he used to live. And it's an incredible passage here. Paul says this to the Philippians. If someone else thinks that they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. He's like, you, you think you got reason to feel good about yourself, feel good about your standing with God and what he thinks of you? Pfft, don't Try comparing yourself to me. I dare you. And then he starts listing reasons why. He says, circumcised on the eighth day, which kind of weird flex there, Paul, but but actually, it would have made a lot of sense 2,000 years ago to his Jewish audience. He, he's, he's starting here a list of kind of his, his Jewish resume, his Jewish bona fides, saying like, I, I've, I've, I'll tell you, I'll tell you about my family line, circumcised on the eighth day, like all good Jewish parents would do. But not only that, check out my bloodlines. He says, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, check, a Hebrew of Hebrews, yeah, that's me. And then he shifts gears a little bit. He says, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Paul's like, look, look, look at my resume, okay? I'm as good of a Jewish person, good, good bloodlines as, as you'll ever find. He's like, you, you wanna talk about taking a step further? I became a Pharisee. I was a religion teacher, okay? I know everything there is to know about this stuff. You wanna question my ambition, my zeal? I persecuted the church. Now, for that one to make sense for us, it helps to understand that, that see, for Paul and for, for Pharisees like Paul, they completely misunderstood what Jesus was about. And you see, when they saw Jesus, this, this movement happening, they thought Jesus was watering down their religion because Jesus was, was saying things about, you know, this law doesn't matter anymore. And, and, and it's like, it seems like he's saying, like, some of the laws never even did matter. Like, what's he talking about? Like, they're making it too easy to get into to right standing with God. And, and so Paul, Paul was, was angry about this, and he got permission to, like, arrest and put in prison and persecute these, these followers of the way, as it was called then. These followers of Jesus who were watering down the, their religion, and so he was zealous as anyone. He was ambitious about, about protecting this law that, that he valued so deeply. And so he persecuted the church. And as, as for righteousness, as for, you know, the do's and don'ts, I was faultless. I performed flawlessly. I did it all. You can't compare to me. Which is what makes what Paul says next so incredible, so mind-blowing, so hard to really wrap your head around. He says all this, and then he goes on and says, but whatever were gains to me before, I now consider loss. Loss, what? What are you talking about? Loss? What, what about that, that whole list of accomplishments, Paul? What, what, your, your performance doesn't matter anymore? What are you talking about? How could you say that? Paul tells us how he can say that for the sake of Christ. I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Jesus? What, what you met Jesus and, and everything changed? There's a, a version of this passage called the, the message that uh, puts scripture into the to language that we'd use today. And I, I love, I think it, it, it really gets to the heart of what Paul was saying in this passage. Here's how the message puts it. The very credentials that these people are waving around as something special I'm tearing them up and throwing it out with the trash along with everything else that I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. You see, Paul had an encounter with Jesus. It changed everything. He saw the world completely differently after he met Jesus. And the question is, why? How'd that happen? What, what took Paul from, from this performance addiction to, you know, you know and, and, and boasting about his performance and his standing with God? What took him from that to now suddenly it, it doesn't matter to him? It all means nothing to him? How'd that happen? I'll tell you how that happened. See, Paul ran into this word right here. Grace. Paul ran into the grace of God. And it changed everything for him. Now to explain what I mean by this, let, let, let me backtrack a little bit. I said that, you know, Paul was going on these, these missions to, you know, to end the, the way, to end this, this Jesus movement, to persecute them, right? And you go on the, these missions. And, um, and so this one time, he's on one of these journeys. 
But what he forgot to factor in is that Jesus had come back from the dead. Okay, so he's, he's on this journey this one time and, and he sees this bright light and he falls to his knees and Jesus himself shows up, okay? Risen from the dead, alive. Jesus shows up to Paul and has a conversation with him and, and Jesus basically says, why are you persecuting me? Why are you against me? And so, so they, they, they have this, this interaction. Paul's blind, okay? He, he can't see and I imagine at this point, Paul's questioning everything. He's questioning his whole life. He's questioning his motives, his why. He's questioning this, this performance filter that he's been viewing life through, just questioning everything. And so he, he ends up at this, this house and he's, he's blind. And a guy named Ananias shows up. God sends Ananias to him. And Ananias basically says to Paul, Paul, God's given you a second chance. God is giving you a fresh start at life. And Paul's in the middle of doing wrong. Like he's on this journey to persecute the church. He's in the middle of this, this do, doing wrong. And Ananias shows up and says, Paul, God's giving you a second chance. Not because you deserve it. It's not because you've earned it. But he's giving you a second chance anyway. And the, the scales fall from Paul's eyes and he's able to see again. I like to imagine, though, that that not only can Paul, like, literally see again, but figuratively sees so much differently and so much better than he ever saw before. Because this this performance filter falls from his eyes as well, right? And he starts to see everything now through the filter of, of grace. And this changes how he sees everything. This grace filter changes the way he sees people, the way he sees himself, and most importantly, the way that he sees God. It changes everything. Grace changed everything for Paul. It was the prescription to his performance addiction. And everything shifted. And I think the the same is true for us, that grace changes everything. That grace is the prescription to our performance addiction. Grace makes us realize that we don't have to work so hard. We don't have to try so hard to to climb that that ladder, to prove to God why he should love us. We don't have to try so hard because grace takes us from exhausted to encouraged. Encouraged at how far God has already brought us, whether that feels like only a little bit or that feels like a lot. We can be encouraged because of grace. We don't have to beat ourselves up. Uh, and keep trying and trying and, and wondering how much harder, how, how much higher we have to climb to get God to love us. No, we can just rest in the encouragement of knowing that we are where we are because you know, God has, has brought us that far, right? And grace takes us from judgmental to grateful. Grateful that we even have his love, that we even have salvation, that we can even be in relationship with him and be part of his family because it was nothing that we did ourselves. It was, it was just by grace that he gave it to us. So how could we be judgmental when we're all on the same page? None of us achieved it. How can we respond any way other than with gratitude? And grace takes us from excluded to included. Belonging, you know, part of the family of God that we've been invited into by our heavenly Father. Grace changes everything from exhausted, judgmental, and excluded. Grace brings us to encouraged, grateful, and included. Grace changes everything. And you see, grace, grace is getting what you don't deserve, right? In, in a world that tells you you get what you deserve, grace says the opposite. Grace says the complete opposite. And that's what Paul discovered, right? Paul, in the middle of his wrongdoing and his, his misguided attempts at, at, at proving to God that he was worth loving, at proving himself to God, performing for God, in the midst of that, Jesus shows up and says, Paul, I'm giving you a second chance. You don't deserve it. You haven't earned it. You've messed up big time, actually. But I'm giving give you a second chance at this. And this changed everything for, for Paul. And we know this because he didn't just talk to the 
Philippians about it. He was telling everyone about this grace that he had received. And to the Christians uh, in the city of Ephesus, he wrote this. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. It's grace. It's a gift. It's not your perfection that gets you right standing with God. It's grace. It's not, not your performance that, that makes God's, God love you. Grace is the only reason that God loves you when you don't deserve it. It's a gift. It's a free gift offered by your heavenly Father. You see, Jesus came. Jesus left heaven, came to earth, put on flesh, experienced life just the same way you and I do. The difference being Jesus never sinned. He never messed up. He never missed the mark. In other words, Jesus lived the perfect performance that you and I could never live. He lived the perfect life that you and I could never live. And in return, his best friends betrayed him. He was spit on, mocked, beaten within inches of his life. He had a crown of thorns placed on his head, nailed to a cross, suffocated for hours on that cross. He eventually died, placed in a grave. But on the third day, Jesus jumps out of that grave victorious and says, anyone who places their faith in me now has an opportunity at eternal life. Not because of your performance, but because of what I have done for you. That is what's on the table for us. That is what's being extended to us. That grace, that gift that comes from Jesus because of what he did on the cross. Nothing we earned, nothing we deserve. It's grace. That's what's being offered to us. And, and with that being the case, what, what do we do with that? Can I suggest to you we do what Paul did and embrace grace. Embrace this grace and receive this gift that Jesus is offering us. Accept this free gift. Are you feeling exhausted? It's by grace you have been saved. Just quit trying to earn it and just embrace grace. Are you feeling Judgmental. It's by grace you've been saved. So quit trying to make other people earn something you never had to earn yourself. And just embrace grace. You feel excluded because of your per poor performance. You feel like you're on the outside. It's by grace you can be saved. You can't earn it. So quit trying to earn it. Exhausted, judgmental, excluded. What do you do? Choose to embrace grace. See, the Christian faith is it's not about perfection. It's not about your performance. So let's quit living as if it is about those things and choose instead to just embrace grace. And then, after embracing this gift, that's free to us. Repackage that gift and extend that. Embrace grace to those around us. Extend that grace to the people around us. Let me give you a couple of questions I'd love for us to, to wrestle with in order to help this sink in today. The first one is this. How can I better treat myself with the grace filter? I'd love you to ask yourself that. How can I better treat myself with the grace filter? What would that look like? What would it look like for you to do that? To stop treating yourself through a performance filter? What would you stop beating yourself up about? In what way would you stop feeling so discouraged and instead become encouraged? What would it look like to treat yourself the grace filter. And secondly, how can I better treat, my, treat others with a grace filter? Think about that. 
How can I better treat others with a grace filter? Who in your life have you been withholding grace from for whatever reason? And what would it look like to just stop and start giving that person grace? And would you be willing to pray, God, help me to see this person through a grace filter, the way that you see them. Help me to see this person as you see this person, the one who has already extended grace to them, offered it to them as a free gift, whether they deserve it or not. Help me to see that person the same way. And help me to see everyone, every single person I come into contact with through a grace filter. What would that look like? How might that change the way you treat people? Because there's a world out there that's desperate to know that there is a God who loves them like that, who loves them free of charge, who offers this free gift. And God is sending us to be the ones to tell them, to show them, to prove to them that this is what our God is like. You see, we're all on the same page here, right? None of us is perfect. None of us can perform well enough to receive God's love. Your good performance doesn't make God love you. And your poor performance doesn't disqualify you from his love either. So would we just choose to embrace grace? Would we do what Paul did and take that performance filter and throw it in the trash and replace it with the grace filter. If we did that, I think it would change everything for you, for me, and for the world around us. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your grace. Jesus, thank you that you don't see us with a performance filter. If we work hard enough, we'll get where we want to go. Thank you that we get what we don't deserve. Jesus, I thank you for what you did in Paul. Thank you that we still have his letters today where we can reflect on the impact that encountering you had on his life and how everything changed when he found grace. God, may that be be true of us. May this not just be head knowledge, but may it actually impact every aspect of our lives. That we would truly embrace grace for ourselves. That we would treat ourselves and see ourselves the way you see us. And we'd extend that same grace to everyone around us. God, give us the wisdom to know what that might look like for each and every one of us. And give us the courage to actually do it. Amen.
There's room at your table for me And I am the one you love And I am the one you love It's me, it's me The real me And I know you're proud Still make my father smile, and I know you're proud of me. You take me just as I am, you choose me all over again, and I am the one you love, and I am the one you love. I don't have to prove anything. This room at your table. never received that free gift that Jesus offers and you'd like to do that today I encourage you to do that to place your faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross and I encourage you to come to the front there's a prayer team that would love to chat more about what that all means and and pray with you if you need prayer for anything today the prayer team will be here for you let's go today in the grace that is offered to us through the risen Savior Jesus Christ Hope to see you back next Sunday.